Hey everyone, welcome to another Facebook Live. This is on Amazon Live as well. Yes, you can watch us on uh, Amazon Live, Facebook Live, and on YouTube at Clean Machine Online. I'm Jeff Palmer, the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. We are a plant-based fitness nutrition. So we're going to be talking about some things about specific to a plant-based uh, diet and plant-based lifestyle, but um, also inclusive of anybody who is consuming an omnivore diet, which is including just about everything. Um, and when I say that, I mean, because we all eat vegetables, really, or we should. Um, so the vast majority of us are eating a diet that has at least some vegetables in it. So this is going to include that too as well. Um, but I'm going to be talking about specific importance and in including a study uh, that is talking about the importance of vitamin D3 and vitamin K2 for a plant-based diet, but for everyone too as well. Um, so before I get started, uh, the disclaimer, this video is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Uh, disclaimer required by the FDA. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Keeping us in check. Okay, so let's jump into the research. So a little while back, back in 2020, November of 2020, a study came out in, called the Epic Oxford Study. And the study was titled Vegetarian and Vegan Diets and Risk of Total and Site-Specific Fractures Results from the Prospective Epic Oxford Study. Uh, so they took a large study and they looked at uh, are, you know, vegans and vegetarians uh, more susceptible to breaking bones, basically, um, for fractures, right? And specifically hip fractures, but looking at all broken bones and, and to see if uh, the vegan or vegetarian diet, a plant-based diet, was negatively impacting bone health. So the study said that overall, their significant associations appeared to be stronger without the adjustment for BMI, or body mass index, and were slightly attenuated when, but remained significant with additional adjustment for dietary calcium. So when you looked at actually calcium intakes, things started to level out a little bit and adjusting for BMI. So why is BMI important? Because body mass index measures body weight, not necessarily how much muscle you're carrying but or fat you're carrying, but just total weight. Well, we all know that bones are formed. Well, not everybody knows, but bones are formed as a uh, structure to resist weight or resist pressure. As a matter of fact, if there was no, uh, uh, like in space, in space, there's no downward pressure from gravity. So if there's no downward pressure pressing on our bones, then our bones, our body says, well, we don't need as much structure there to hold up the house, to hold up the body. So it actually starts disintegrating some of the bones. So that's one of the things astronauts have to take very good care of because they have to do resistance type training in there to keep their bone density. Otherwise they start losing bone density because there's no resistance against that. Well, the same goes when you carry more weight on your frame. If you are carrying more weight on your frame, as many in the standard American diet do, they tend to be obese. Remember, up to 66% of Americans right now are considered overweight or obese. 66, and that number is going up. It's getting closer to 70% in the, the more recent data. That's over two-thirds of the Americans overweight or obese. That means they're carrying a lot more on their frame. So, of course, their bone density is going to be higher because that structure of bones has to carry more weight so it has to get denser the body adapts by adding more bone tissue to be able to carry that weight without fracturing so vegans and vegetarians those on a plant-based diet tend to be leaner not necessarily all of them there's definitely junk food vegans out there that can carry a, a lot of extra body weight um, and, and bmi only measures body weight so even a very healthy person carrying a lot of muscle yeah, <laughs> uh, I have a really high BMI for my age, but it's not because I'm carrying body fat. It's because I'm carrying extra muscle. So BMI is not a great uh, indicator of uh, your 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 true lean body mass. Um, but that's a whole different story. So 
when you looked at adjustments for BMI, then you see that, okay, well, if you're a lighter weight, then you probably don't need as dense a bone. And that's the case with generally with women, unless you're postmenopausal. Now, here is my theory. And look, this is just a theory. This has not been borne out in, in research yet, but I would love to see some research on this that I think that postmenopausal women, once their body goes into menopause, they are not able to have a pregnancy. Well, if the body is holding on to more bone density because there is a potential that a female could add a lot of weight, 30, 40 pounds maybe, because she's carrying a child, of course she would need to carry more bone density for the potential of carrying an extra baby, which would be a lot more weight on her frame, and she'd need to support that weight on the bones. Once the body goes into menopause, I, my guess is that the body says, okay, there is no possibility for her to be carrying a baby, so we don't need the bone to be as dense as it was before. So in this case, then the body would shift hormonally and trigger the body to not store as much calcium in the form of bone tissue. Now this makes, would make perfect sense, right? If you're not gonna use the extra bone tissue, get rid of it because you're just carrying extra bone weight, which is burning extra calories, which you don't need. And the body is always trying to be as efficient with its calories as possible. Okay, so then they looked at, so there's a big concern because a lot of women get freaked out when they get into menopause and they start losing bone density. I think some of that concern is unwarranted, but you always want to take a look at this and always talk it over with your healthcare practitioner because there may be some serious actual bone loss there that may be a concern and put you at a higher risk for hip fractures. But let's take a look at this next study. So this next study came out this year, and this study is called Dietary Patterns and Hip Fracture in the Adventist Health Study 2. So what they did is combined vitamin D and calcium supplementation does that mitigate increased hip fracture risk amongst vegans. So this actually looked at vegans in there and looked at women. And while women who followed vegan diets did have a higher increased risk for fractures, when they actually looked at the data a little deeper and further analysis showed that women on a plant-based diet or vegan diet who took both calcium supplements and vitamin D supplements did not have any greater risk fractures when compared to non-vegetarian women. Okay, so this is a really good thing. It's just saying, well, maybe, maybe we're just needing to adjust the fact that we're just not getting enough sunlight. And because those eating an animal-based diet could be getting vitamin D through dairy or other sources that those on a plant-based diet aren't getting. And therefore, it may be just the vitamin D that's the problem. But what they pointed out is that those taking both calcium and vitamin D supplements did not have any greater risk. And the, the study also showed, results showed no increased risk for fractures uh, for men on a vegan diet, which is really cool. That's good. So is that calcium the real culprit? So my guess is more it is the vitamin D and not so much the calcium because there can be in a healthful plant-based diet, you can be getting lots of calcium from dark greens and from other fruits and vegetables that have calcium sources in it. Lots of nuts have great sources of calcium, almonds, things like that. So I, I'm guessing that it's not so much the calcium and it's more the vitamin D. So let's take a look at this next study because they actually did break it out. And this was published back in February of 2003 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So a great uh, resource. And it, which is interesting, they looked at three different factors, calcium, vitamin D, and milk consumption. Now this one's kind of interesting because it included milk. And they separated them apart to see if any of one of these three, two of these three, or all three of these three actually mattered as far as risk for hip fractures. Okay, so what they found were women consuming a 500 IUs of vitamin D3, that's about uh, 12.5 micrograms, 
uh, consuming vitamin D3 from food and supplements had a 37% lower risk of hip fracture than those consuming not an insufficient amounts of vitamin D3. So that's interesting, a 37% greater risk just by the vitamin D alone. So they looked at the other two groups and saw, see if this was a factor at hip fractures. So they looked at total calcium intake. And remember that last study, the uh, Adventist Health 2 study showed that it was taking calcium and vitamin D3 that reduced the risk down to nil, down to nothing. There was no increased risk on a plant-based diet from hip fractures when they were taking vitamin D3 and calcium. But is it the calcium or is it just the vitamin D3? Well, I think it's answered here in this study when it says, this is from the study, the calcium, vitamin D, and milk study, total calcium intake was not associated with hip fracture, even at 1,200 milligrams per day. So compared with 600 milligrams a day, there was no difference in hip fracture rates, none. So calcium wasn't making a difference at all. So that's what I was, I was assuming. I'm like, okay, so we're getting good sources of calcium in our food sources. It may not be the calcium. It may be the fact that we're just not getting vitamin D because we're inside. We have no sun overhead. We're not getting that sun exposure. And remember, the sun exposure can be a lot more. If you're carrying extra body fat, you need more sun exposure. If you are darker skin, you need more sun exposure because the melanin in dark skin, the darker the skin, the more the melanin actually reflects the sunlight. So you don't overproduce vitamin D3. That's why lighter skin actually burns, burns more but absorbs more vitamin D3. The darker the skin, the less vitamin D3. D3 is fat soluble. So if you're carrying a lot of body fat, that D3 can get soaked up by the fat cells and then you have to consume actually more vitamin D3 just to get your levels up to normal and healthy and sufficient levels. So there are lots of other factors. Aging, they've shown as you age, once you hit about 50, 60, 70 years of age, your body's ability to process and bioactivate vitamin D3 goes down too. So you may need more as you age. You may need more as you are gaining weight. You may need more if your skin color is different. If you're in the Northern hemisphere, the, the the earth, this big round ball is curved. So if the sun is hitting it at a wrong angle, it actually reflects off of the atmosphere. So they've shown at the 33rd parallel, anything above that during the winter months, even if you're getting direct sunlight, you're getting zero vitamin D3 absorption. So this is really important for northerners. And if you look, most of the colds and flus, they break out when? In the winter. Where? In the northern areas, mostly, predominantly. That's where they come because that's when D3 levels go down, which D3 is directly related to an immune support. So if you lower your immune, you're more susceptible to colds and flus. There you have it. So let's talk about this. Was milk a factor in this? And I'll read this directly verbatim from the study. Milk consumption was not associated with a lower risk of hip fracture. None, no association for milk. So it's not the calcium. This whole thing that calcium you know, from milk is doing the body good, not so much, not according to the research. It's not the calcium, it was more the vitamin D. Now, vitamin D helps the body pull calcium into the bones. So that's important. So once we consume the calcium in our food, then it's broken down, goes into our um, bloodstream, then it's got to be pulled up into the bones and vitamin D3 helps that. But what also helps that is vitamin K2. So what uh, vitamin K2 does is it actually helps the body create this really cool structure inside the bone called osteocalcin. Osteocalcin creates this web work. Have you ever seen a bridge go over a bridge and you notice all that web work underneath the bridge? That is to help strengthen the bridge to make it really strong and supportive. The same thing in if you ever break open a bone and you see those like cobweb structures in there, that's osteocalcin. That forms that web work, that lattice work that strengthens the bone. 
Less vitamin K2 means less of that lattice work and less stronger bones and more risk for hip fractures. So vitamin K2 is very important. Now the big question was, okay, well, wait a minute. Vitamin K2 is mostly found in animal products, some fermented foods too as well. But does that mean that vegans aren't getting their vitamin K2? Oh, oh no, you know. Um, sorry about that, running a little low on the battery there. Um, uh, but so the big question then was, where, where do um, vegans and on those on a plant-based diet or those consuming mostly vegetables are getting their vitamin K2? Well, look at vitamin K2 supplements. Where does vitamin K2 supplement? How's it made? It's made from the fermentation of soy. Natto is a very common food eaten in Japan, which is fermented soybeans. And this forms K2. But what is it on the natto that's actually doing the fermentation? microbes. Right. They are fermenting the soybean. Well, guess what we have in our gut? A big old fermentation tank, right? These, these bacteria, the ones that actually create K2, they do it by taking um, phyloquinones uh, or, or vitamin K1 from plants and they metabolize it. They break it down into vitamin K2. Now, vitamin K2 has a bunch of different forms, MK4, MK7, all the way up to MK13. There's a whole bunch of different forms of MK, of forms of vitamin K2. So the, the, the bacteria in our gut actually break that down and pull in that uh, vitamin K1 and then break it down and convert it into K2. So the original studies that were done on vitamin K1 uh, uh, to see if there was vitamin K conversion happening, they were shown on, on those eating a standard omnivore diet with a very low amount of fiber in their diet. And unfortunately that skewed the study results and they didn't, weren't thinking that. They were saying, oh, okay, well then if they don't convert it, well, what's happening? When you consume fiber, you feed the bacteria in your gut that do the conversion of vitamin K1 into vitamin K2. So if you are not consuming enough fiber, you are not feeding those bacteria and the population goes down. So that's what they saw in the study in omnivores. They weren't eating enough fiber, so they're not feeding the bacteria. So those bacteria starve and go away. <laughs> they go down in the quantity. And then there's not enough of those bacteria actually to convert enough vitamin K to K1 to K2. But when you have a person who's a healthy microbiome eating the appropriate amounts of fiber, then you have a big raise in those uh, bacteria that are doing it. So much so that up to 70% of all the vitamin K2 that gets converted in our gut actually just gets pooped out because we have so much of it. It's way more than our body even needs. So we discard it. But that does mean we need to keep eating a good source of fiber and a good source of plant sourced vitamin K1 because almost all of vitamin K comes from plants with the, with the exception of um, uh, some animal products that actually have that preformed in it. But what you're doing is getting an animal to do what our animal, our own body, which we're an animal, does in our microbiome, which is take that plant K1 and convert it to vitamin K2. So let's read some of the research. There's six studies here showing this one. This one says vitamin K2 or uh, menaquinone, which is synthesized by certain intestinal bacteria that feed on fiber. So what are some good sources of vitamin K1? So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up those sources right on the, so if you're watching on Facebook Live, here are your top 10 sources and look at number one there, boom. Number one is kale. And look at that percentage, 800, over 800% 800 of vitamin K1 good sources of greens. Your dark green leafy vegetables, cabbage, spinach, kale, chard, um, mustard greens, these are all great sources of vitamin K1. But guess what the number one source of vitamin K is? Take a look at this right. Boom, right there. Vitamin K, 1100% in one scoop of clean green protein with lentine. That's, that's 11 times more than the body actually needs. That's how good a source of vitamin K 
it is. It is a tremendous source of vitamin K. So, but you need two things. You need the vitamin K, K1 in the plants, 1100% and one scoop of clean green protein with lentine. That lentine is just a powerhouse of nutrition. And then you are getting all the fiber and all the polyphenols to feed those probiotics so that they can do the conversion to K2. Remember, there's a whole host of K2. Most of the supplement K2 you'll find out there just has either uh, MK4 or MK7 only in it. Not the broad spectrum of all the K forms that you that our body needs and utilizes. Now, our body can take in this and store it in the liver and other organs in the body too. So your body can hold on to some of this uh, uh, vitamin K, but the vitamin K and the D3 work together to strengthen the bones. So maybe not so much the calcium, but more so making sure you're getting dark green leafy vegetables like clean green protein with lentine, the richest source of vitamin K1 that we know of right now. So tremendous source of uh, vitamin K1. Also B12 is in this naturally occurring inside the actual plant and as well as the vegan D3. Now, D3 is important instead of D2. Now, this is so exciting to me, this vegan D3, because of the first 100% pure D3 from a vegan source. And it's from organic algae, the first from organic algae, which makes you getting an organic source. It's 100% pure D3, no vitamin D2 in there. Really interesting study found that when you consume vitamin D2, it's about 87% less effective as vitamin D3 and doesn't even stay in the body as long either. Not only that, studies showed on strength, vitamin D3 increased strength by about 20%, which is amazing because osteocalcin not only strengthens the bones, it helps strengthen muscles, which is very cool too. Um, new study on osteocalcin and, and uh, muscle strength. Check that one out. Just look it up, type, type in Google, osteocalcin muscle strength. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, I cover that in one of my other videos. So check out some of the other videos I talk about vitamin K2 as well. But you've got a plant-based source of, of D3. You've got it in its 100% pure potency and it's organic. It's the first of its kind to come from organic algae in 100% pure form. Glad to bring this to market. Excited to give you the best, always, the number one source of vitamin K on the planet, the only 100% pure vegan D3 um, uh, from organic algae on the planet. First to bring these products to you, bring you the best that nature has to offer so that when you take these products, just taking them once a day and you're set, you know you're getting the absolute best sources found from nature. That's what you can do. If you're looking to just get by, there's cheaper stuff out there. But if you're looking for optimal health, if you're looking to get the most out of this life while you are alive, to get the best health you can live, to live the healthiest and happiest body you can live in, then I'm producing products that are for you because I am combing the planet for the absolute best sources of nutrients out there so that you can have the option if you too are interested in living your best life. Thanks for joining me. I hope you tune in again. If you have any questions, as always, you can leave them down in the the box below. I answered them on Clean Machine Online and on uh, Facebook too as well. So join us there and always as well on Amazon Live. Thanks everyone for joining me. Hope this information helps you make better choices so that you can live the life you deserve. Enjoy.